Mike Holmes. Thank you, Jeff. Well, thank you, Jeff, and thank you all for the opportunity to present here. Um, a year ago, we covered the roadmap and the focus of the R&D program for the lignite research industry. And then uh, six months ago, we had a panel on the carbon management side. And uh, Thursday, we're going to give an update on the carbon management work, and that happens to be the biggest area of focus. And so today, I'm going to start with just one slide talking about the roadmap, because it gives the industry's direction for the lignite research program. The first bullet you see there is for supporting continued options to enhance the performance of our existing fleet, and that continues to be a, a, one of the big focus areas. And then the second bullet is investing in transformational research for next generation power, power systems. And the third bullet happens to be one of the biggest areas of focus that we've had in recent years, and that's carbon management. So for focusing on carbon capture, utilization and storage, and with a focus on that use of CO2. And then the last couple bullets are two areas that are also of high level importance, lower funding effort, but high importance areas. The first one is leveraging international breakthroughs in R&D. And then the last one there is a renewed focus on additional value opportunities for lignite use and uh, also then as part of that polygeneration. So uh, multiple products, not just electricity from coal. So those are the, uh, the directives, the direction of the Lignite Research Program. And then this time for a one slide background on the, on the history of successes, I put this type of slide together. Last year I put one up that showed since 1970, the gross domestic product has increased by 3.5, um, electric power production by 2.5, and all the while emissions have been reduced over 70%, and with uh, on the order of 90% in most pollutants coming out of the coal-fired electricity. This slide shows some of the historical successes of the Lignite Research Program that most people here have been in involved in throughout the the duration of the program. The first one just talks about early on how we addressed the challenges with the uh, inorganics in the fuel, and we went from being able to survive with uh, high sodium lignite coal to thriving with it. We understand better than anywhere in the world what to do with those types of inorganics in the coal. Um, also, we met all uh, the uh, challenges associated with the primary pollutants like SOx, NOx, particulate, and then one I like to bring up, because of the huge success it was, back about 15 years ago, DOE was estimating that the cost for capturing mercury in the coals west of the Mississippi, where there was less reactive mercury, was going to be sixty dollars to $80,000 per pound. And with the work that Team North Dakota did, we got more than 20 times improvement in that cost for capture. So we tackled the mercury and trace element capture challenge. Uh, there was a lot of early support in the program for what's now the, the uh, U.S. Is the only coal to sin fuels plant at DGC. Um, the Lignite Vision 21 had the success of the, uh, the Great River Energy Spearwood plant combined with the fuel upgrading that they do with their dry fining process. Just to highlight a few, as well as the mine update, or the mine improvements, the plan improvements through data, instrumentation and controls, and so on. So I'm going to briefly hit the carbon management. We'd certainly be able to talk to anyone in more detail on this. But then Thursday at 1.15, so tomorrow after lunch, there's a panel with the experts from industry and the R&D side that'll present in a lot more depth on this. So I've just got a few slides giving you an update on some of these projects now. But again, a lot more detail available at 1.15 tomorrow. Um, this slide I borrowed from Elite Clean Energy and, and Minn Kota Power, and it basically shows the three prongs of the carbon management challenge. And those three main prongs are carbon capture solutions for existing plants, 
um, carbon management technologies for next generation power, and then the subsurface work. And we're fortunate uh, uh, in this region to have the uh, work that the EERC led in PCOR for over a decade and a half to help understand the geology and the opportunity in the region. So the next couple slides just touch on that a little bit, and so I'll briefly hit some main points on these. But basically, we have great geology in our region. So not only we're looking at unlocking this 800-year supply of lignite, we've got that, the oil and gas resource, the great people and the work ethic in the region, but we also have the geology needed to be able to store this CO2. And the PCOR information on this slide shows that we have in the, on the order for including saline formations deep down 23 to 78 billion tons of CO2 storage capacity. Um, but then when you look at the oil opportunity, and I skipped a slide on the conventional oil, this slide shows the tight oil. But conventional oil, it's one to 200 million tons of capacity of CO2 storage while you're producing oil from the conventional wells. But more importantly, we've got to keep focusing on the work that PCOR and others have done on the uh, Bakken because there we're looking at 2, point, or 2 to 3.2 billion tons of CO2 for EOR for a commodity value for that CO2. And that's to be able to produce just an additional 4% of the oil that's in place in the Bakken. So that there's a great opportunity down the road there that we have to focus on too while we initially look at that conventional oil. So I'll just hit this slide quick. It again goes over the uh, great resources we have with a, you know, 25 trillion, a uh, billion tons of uh, recoverable lignite in our region. Um, so over an 800 year supply at current use rates. And then I'm just gonna hit a couple slides each on some of those major projects that we have in the carbon management side. This uh, first slide is for a project titled North Dakota Integrated Carbon Storage Complex Feasibility Study. It's one of Department of Energy's carbon safe projects. And it's a project that includes a great team of industry working with the R&D side. It's led by Wes Peck of the EERC and the industry partners include Elite Clean Energy, BNI Energy, Basin Electric, and Minn Kota Power. And uh, they've done a great job on the outreach events, holding uh, out outreach events, uh, events at the schools as well as tours on the site and put out good information on it. The current status of that project is they've uh, completed drilling of the wells at both Oliver and Mercer County counties, and they're working on the uh, uh, data analysis from the uh, well logs, and uh, all that's underway, as well as the uh, evaluation of the economics and uh, better understanding that storage opportunity. And the prime driver for this is to better understand that geology and drill down into the deeper level of detail. Um, for that geology to give uh, even more confidence in, in the CO2 storage opportunity right there at those locations. Um, and so that one is ongoing. Um, the reporting is, is continuing as they report the various milestones. And uh, so that project's well underway and we'll get more detail on that Thursday. And then you hear about Project Tundra um, driven by industry and they're looking at carbon capture solutions for the existing plants integrated with the ability to use that CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. And so as a precursor to that, we have a project with the Lignite Research Program titled Project Carbon. And that's led by Jason Lom of the EERC with industry partners, Elite Clean Energy, BNI Energy, and Minn Kota Power Cooperative. And that project is starting off with some amine testing. They're working with uh, MHI, Mitsubishi, and they're testing first their baseline solvent, the KS1 solvent, and uh, then they'll be looking at advanced solvents in the future. Um, they're getting ready in the next month to be testing that solvent, and then they're gonna take their capture facility, 
move it out to the Milton R. Young plant, and then this summer be testing at the site on the actual flue gas at Milton R. Young. So that work continues as well as preparation of the equipment for looking at aerosol management and other aspects of the project. They've completed construction of that, putting it in place and shaking it down. Um, so that continues with management and reporting and they're uh, doing weekly report, uh, conference calls with industry and, and the technology developer Mitsubishi and so you can hear more about that project on Thursday as well and also the alum cycle work so that next generation power technology development work where you're looking at upfront gas firing the coal taking the sink gas that's produced cleaning it up some and then at high pressure con combusting that with oxygen so then you're driving the turbine with high pressure high temperature CO2 the goals of that technology are driving a turbine with supercritical CO2, having a, CO, a sequestration ready and a, and a EOR ready, CO2 available as a product along with the electricity, and then targeting low cost electricity with uh, goals as low as four to seven cents per kilowatt hour. And they're targeting very high efficiency, just under 50% for uh, lignite coal in the high 40% range. So with that work, um, they finished up a draft final report at the end of December of 2017, and they're working on a polished version of the final, and they also further leveraged the state and industry investment by recently getting an award, additional $700,000 from the DOE to do additional engineering work on that. So with that, we keep our eyes also on the LaPorte, Texas work where they have about a 50 megawatt thermal, 25 megawatt electric system. They're getting ready to start the natural gas combustion in that. And then in the next coming months into the summer, they'll be testing the full integrated system. And then our next stage on the alum cycle is they've addressed the different barriers, including uh, material side, gas fire selection, um, impurity removal, all those different barriers that were identified. The next one to address more fully is the syngas combustion side. So uh, that's what they'll be working on next. And the two sites they've identified for that have been Laporte, Texas as a possibility, as well as Dakota gasification. So with that, as I said, I've got several topics to cover here today. One of the action items was to look at leveraging international R&D work. And so uh, if you look at that, um, we've got leveraging of international R&D work going on just in the carbon management topic that we talked about. We have the uh, collaboration with Mitsubishi on the Project Tundra po Project Carbon side. And uh, they're constantly talking to Mitsubishi Japan. They made a trip to Japan, the team did, to talk to them about leveraging what they learned at the Petronova plant in Texas with the technology to make great savings on the next one, looking at as high as 20 to 30% savings. Um, then we have Boundary Dam to the north across the border, and they're looking at um, leveraging that um, I was just at a meeting in Vancouver on that, and they're looking at 30% savings over that technology on the second of a kind. And then when you look at additional opportunities um, for international, we've uh, engaged Brown Coal Innovation Australia, and we're working with them to renew the collaboration we had way back on the behavior of the ash and inorganics and we're looking now at renewing the collaboration on the, on the areas of additional uses for lignite beyond just electricity production. So I went there in February and did a presentation, and I'll just put a few of those slides up as the next part of the topic. Um, and by the way, also as part of uh, additional collaboration, our governor signed an MOU with the governors of Montana, Wyoming, and Premier Wall from Saskatchewan and so that was the trip to Vancouver, was to initiate discussions on how we collaborate with those states and Saskatchewan more on leveraging information to uh, bring down costs, bring down parasitic load associated with 
carbon capture, use, and storage. And there's a lot of collaboration already going on. PCOR is working with them on their um, geologic side up at, up at uh, Boundary Dam. Um, we've got work going on the economic side with Wyoming, but the, the emphasis is on expanding that collaboration. Um, on the Australia presentation, just a few of the slides focus on things like the, poly, the need for more work on the polygeneration side. We've got the great example at Dakota Gasification of uh, commercially providing a multitude of products from our lignite coal, and there are other products that you can produce as well. Um, so that's one area with a focus there on nitrogen and fertilizers, and they were grabbing onto that because they're looking at, and I'll mention some of their land application for lignite and fertilizers in a bit, but DGC just finished their urea production, and so they're putting up 1,100, if I got the number right, about 1,100 tons per day of urea now. Um, so a lot of opportunities to gasify Use the building blocks you create from the gasification and building a suite of different chemicals, fuels, as well as CO2 and uh, fertilizers, things like that. Um, just a little more on the fertilizer front. Um, EERC provided this slide. They're looking at a small-scale fertilizer technology. Um, I want to at least hit this topic a little bit. This happens to be an area of focus in Australia right now as well, but I put this slide up and talked about the different materials that we can make from coal. Um, everything from the uh, planned activity at Valley City for uh, activated carbon production. I mentioned up in Estevan, Saskatchewan to them that we have commercially produced Kingsford charcoal briquettes for cooking. Um, but also you can make carbon black for tires from coal. You can make uh, carbon fires, fiber, for high strength, low weight materials. Um, in the end, you can look at major parts of an automobile being made from coal, coal-derived products. Um, there was a, a professor from a university that presented a little bit after me and presented a lot on the carbon materials and talking about the advanced manufacturing work and using things like 3D printers to make products with starting materials out of lignite coal. So there, there's a chance to collaborate on that. And also work on the graphite side, so making things like anodes from battery and other graphene materials. Um, just briefly wanted to put up one that, you know, we talk about um, indirect coal liquefaction where you gasify and then make fuels, chemicals, and products, but also we can't forget the opportunity for direct liquefaction. A lot of work was done in the past on that. Um, as the price of oil is up in the mid-60s now, that's something that we should look at more, and it's a good blend stock for indirect liquefaction products. Another area that's kind of taken off on the R&D side in the last year especially has been high-value material extraction from coal and especially rare earth elements. And so um, I'll hit some slides briefly on that, but. We're up to uh, four projects with a fifth one pending. Um, and some of these projects are heavily leveraged with DOE funding, where the lion's share of the funding is federal, and so it greatly leverages our Lignite Research Program funding. And some of the information um, is really looking promising in this area, but the rare earth elements are critical to the U.S. They're like chemical vitamins, critical in electronics, catalysts, um, applications in medical industry as, re as well as defense industry, and there's a huge market out there for the products that rely on rare earth elements, el electronics especially. And so um, the rare earth element is, is a area is a big focus of the U.S. as they um, look at the supply being almost 100 percent from China, and that supply dwindling some as well as some of the stresses of getting that feedstock needed for the valuable products. Um, but basically, some of the initial findings from that um, started with work by the North Dakota, North Dakota Geologic Survey showing that in the coal-related products, the coal and the ash, there's uh, target levels that were set by DOE of rare earth element, element occurrence. So that's promising. Then some of the initial work 
on um, being able to extract those rare earth elements and get their target levels of a stream that's over 2% content of rare earth elements, that, that's looking successful and now has to be scaled up. And now they're moving from the coal to some research on the ash side. So uh, we've got in this last grant round another proposal that again is looking at leveraging 30K investment by us to a half a million dollar federal project. So a lot of good, exciting work going on the rare earth element side. And uh, one I want to hit because it drew a lot of attention on the Australia presentation is we've got oxidized lignite being used for land applications called leonardite. And when, the, when I presented this and a couple presenters later was an Australian on the ag side, he talked about it. And he said, yeah, this idea, you saw the slide from Mike, comes from North Dakota, Professor Leonard. And uh, so yeah, I remember Leonard Hall now. <laughs> Put two and two together. But they're looking at, and have already done two years worth of studies and shown that they can use the Leonardite mixed with urea to get a lot more bang for the buck out of both the urea and the Leonardite. So they're working very hard on land applications. And I can see I'm running low on time for Q&A, so I'll hit these quick, but we have a lot of good combined heat and power opportunities. Um, I presented on that as well as the, uh, the uh, team led by North American Coals looking at um, leftover heat and CO2 from power production and doing ag applications, including greenhouse applications for uh, use of that energy for combined heat and power. Um, you know, GRE uses uh, low-grade heat for their beneficiation. Um, so a lot of different opportunities. And then I just wanted to close with the slide on advanced reclamation because that's where the Lignite Research Program started way back when was the reclamation side. And we've got the team out there looking at even further advancing the reclamation. With the incredible job that the state already does in this area, they're always making improvements. So with that, I've got just a hair over five minutes left, so I left time for Q&A. And please, anything that you don't have time to discuss up here, catch me out there, ask me more questions. But more importantly, save your tough questions for the, the guys on Thursday. So, Do we have questions for Mike? Questions, anyone? I want to ask you about the rare earth minerals while we're looking for a question out there. Where are they used and, and what's the future demand for rare earth minerals? Why are these so important? Yeah, the, uh, the rare earth elements, um, you know, they're heavily used in catalysts, um, definitely electronics. So uh, they've even looked at cell phones and, uh, and recycling some of the rare earth elements out of, out of cell phones. And they become so critical because they're, even though they're small amounts of use, they're critical parts of all those components to um, you know, medical devices, things like that, that they are definitely necessary. And if you look at the supply in China, they're projecting it, the uh, inventory dropping way off and the price um, possibly going back up to where it was several years ago. So it becomes more than just the economic driver in front of us. As a nation, it becomes a uh, strategic driver as well. So, but we have to look at it from an economic opportunity. And so that's where the next stage in that is scaling up to this size, to barrel size, and then projecting those economics out to a commercial system that could be uh, run here in North Dakota. And we have, um, with the lignite, holding it less tightly than anthracite and some of the other coals, it looks like we have a great opportunity because of concentration and availability of the rare earth elements. So stay tuned on that one. So when, when we say unlocking 800 years of lignite, we're not kidding. We'll probably still be using it 800 years from now. Yeah, yeah. for many different options. Yeah, OK. Other questions? I know we're standing between you and lunch. So all right. Thank you, Mike, very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good job. Good job. All right. All right, folks, short and sweet. Make sure you got your name tags on and lunch is on the other side of the exhibit hall. Say hi to all the exhibitors on your way through. Uh, let's get going on lunch because we got a great afternoon program ahead of us too. Thanks for coming.